uh, a little about Professor Kurla Varki. He was born on the 14th July 1945 and he studied architecture in IIT Kharagpur. He came to Ahmedabad in 1968, joining Vastushilp as a trainee and later as an architect. In 1977, Professor Varki took a teaching post at the University of Nairobi and in the years to come, he initiated a complete overhaul of department's curriculum and teaching methods. He then joined the master's program in architecture at the University of Helsinki and traveled all across Europe. Returning to India in 1987, he was appointed director of School of Architecture at SEPT University. He took this as an opportunity to emphasize the relationship of architecture to culture and urban context during this venture as a director. He had been a much respected and sought after participant in educational and professional forums across the country. Yet, he maintained a close relationship with each student he taught. We are very glad to have Mrs. Alice Varki and their daughter Mayuri here with us. And we thank all of you to grace us with your presence. I now invite Apurva to introduce Professor Chaya. Over to you, Apurva. Good evening, everyone. It is indeed very special for us to be able to say that we are students of Professor Chaya. We're all really happy to have him here for this year's Kurla Varki Memorial Lecture. Professor Chaya was born in Nairobi and he studied architecture as a student in SEPT between 1969 and 1975. He worked under Professor Rajay in 1976, after which he went back to Nairobi. He started his teaching career very early and worked in close association with Professor Varki in Nairobi and then back in India. Professor Chaya came back to SEPT in 1987 and has had an immense contribution to teaching architecture here. Apart from architecture, he has a passionate interest in Indian classical music, as well as literature, philosophy, and human science. I now invite Professor Chaya to please take the dice. Thank you very much, <laughs> Apurva, Tanvi, Vaishnavi, all of those who have worked to make this event again this year. I was initially under the impression that I was to give an ordinary uh, what is called a keynote speech. I was hoodwinked by the students because they later sent me a mail saying that I am to deliver the Kurula Varki Memorial Lecture. And those who have known Varki will understand the level of responsibility that that entails. He was a person whom we knew for so many years and I propose that today's talk will be more like a conversation with him, more like a reflection upon where we are, what is the world around us today, what is architecture today? What is education today? Because he would not have separated out these four areas of interest. That the individual, the friendship and groups of individuals, the world, architecture, all of these he saw as an interconnected set. And very often, late into the night, we would talk about this. He much later than me. I cannot keep awake as long as he would. And normally at about 10.30, I would start nodding my head. Not in agreement, but as an indication of sleep. Whereas he would continue. Often I have seen him, he was a very serious man, very, very 
very studious and very playful man. I've seen him sitting in front of a book with the drawing open alone, alone in his room, hand going like this, paying respect to the man who made that. I've rarely seen people like that who could have such almost childlike pleasure in something which has happened in the world. So he was a very, like all of us, he was a very complex human being and a very simple one at that. So we'll talk as if he is thinking and as if I'm thinking and maybe something starts happening together. He had some favorite authors and I will quote very freely from them, especially Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations during the peak of the Cold War and who died in an air crash over Congo and who wrote a book called Markings. And this was Barkey's favorite book, thin book like this few pages and you open it in the most strained of times that was his his uh, source of strength and what Hammerschold wrote almost could describe Varki at times here's a passage to be nothing in the self-effacement of humility Yet, for the sake of the task, to embody its whole weight and importance in your caring, as the one who has been called to undertake it, to give to people, works, poetry, art, what the self can contribute, and to take, simply and freely, what belongs to it by reason of its identity. Praise and blame, the winds of success and adversity, blow over such a life without leaving a trace or upsetting its balance. My friends will agree that this is working. No praise, no blame, disappear into the background, but do. But it might sound as if this is a grave and very serious kind of person. But he had an impish sense of humor, a very wild sense of humor at times, sometimes a very ribald and dirty sense of humor. He was very fond of limericks. So in the studio, he would come and pin up every day a limerick. So this was one he pinned up one day. There was an old man of Madras, now think what can come next, <laughs> who rode on a cream-colored ass, but the length of its years so promoted his fears that it killed that old man of Madras. So this was what he would pin up before midnight. After midnight, at about two o'clock, he would come and pin up in that wonderful handwriting of his, the dirty version. I dare not speak it here. I'm sure a lot of you know it. Otherwise, it's available on the net. You can look it up. There was an old man of Madras. Look it up. <laughs> so... One of my friends, Sohan, sitting here, it was quite okay for us to give back whatever he was giving us. So he wrote a, a limerick for Varki. A clear-headed man was Varki. Nothing in his head was murky. But his mind was no good when it came to any food, he couldn't tell his chicken from his turkey. <laughs> that too is an apt description of the man. 
and after our studio he would trundle his bicycle along to liberty which was the only place where tea was available after midnight and on the way he would be spouting t s eliot's poetry full at the top of his voice and on the way back would come the limericks well into the night so he is a man of of such parts and when we talk together about the world today we must remember that the world is not just an unhappy place it's a place of so many happenings it's a place of terrible things happening and it's a place of great joy and great potentiality so verki believed in the possibility of goodness in humans that humans could be good like shakespeare had said what a piece of work is a man how noble in reason this is verki again reading huh? he was a theater man how noble in reason how infinite in faculty in form and moving how express and admirable in action how like an angel in apprehension how like a god the beauty of the world the paragon of animals so that was one image of man verki had that image says it's wonderful human beings they can be so good so compassionate so uh, courageous and so capable of doing what is needed but he also had another line from t s eliot human kind cannot bear very much reality and he could see both sides of this he could see that this was a complex creature and that the human capacity for altruism for justice and ethical inner compass was the teacher's true metier that the teacher helped the student to bring out that inner compass to unravel to take away all those all those curtains and make the student capable and free to see which way to go i don't know i was thinking while writing this is this too serious and then i realized why did the students take so much trouble and effort to organize the kurla worki design forum why it's not entertainment it's not an escape it will not bring them fame their names are not even written on any of the posters the people who are behind this so many of them they are anonymous so it won't give them fame fame it won't give them glory and yet they spent so much time so much effort to make this happen why did they do that i think it shows that in our young people there is a hunger for the real there is a hunger for something beyond selfish action something which is of a caring of for the for everything and i think this is what the students are have that spark and the world can extinguish it institutions and the world around can help either to kindle that spark or to extinguish it and the question is what are we up to doing now with the systematization of life that we see everywhere everything is made into systems a student a uh, five year old is already into systems and right through it's the system of life which takes the student away from nature has no tangible or deep relationships with other humans and the only direction that society shows him is profit no other direction 
And so therefore this young person is hungry. Illich has written in his uh, essay, Philosophy, Artifacts and Friendship, our students show an amazing interest in the practice of philia. Philia, love for, in the practice of love. Yeah? Our students show an amazing interest in the practice of philia, the more so, the more clearly they understand the sadness of having lost all moorings. It is a society which has made people without moorings. And I never cease to be surprised by the readiness of serious students to accept my claim that the philosophical grasp of the nature of technology has become a fundamental condition for ethics in a milieu symbolized by Windows 95. This is written in 96. So I think that this, nothing is too serious to discuss in front of these students because they are hungry to find out what is the direction. And they are not hungry to find out how to do things, but why or what? What kind of a society do we build? So there are two paradigms of society, three actually, that we have on the national scene, on the international scene, everywhere. One I call the pessimistic paradigm, though it is seen by everybody as the most attractive paradigm, very attractive, colourful, well illustrated, but I call it the pessimistic paradigm. This is the view of experts. Experts always say you have to make systems to manage the world. It is the view of the mentally old and it is the view of the cynical. What is the view? Humans are by nature greedy, selfish, afraid. This is the pessimistic view of mankind and the whole capitalistic system and the whole systematization of global economies, global states, global education systems, the systematization is a very, very pessimistic outlook. Make systems that manage through rewards and punishment that scatter the time and leave no time for aimless reflection, but always focused inquiry, critically sharp, in the, in the highest traditions of rationality. For justice in this system, you will need measurable standards. There can be no justice which says, I freely give to you. There is no free lunch. And for justice you will need measurable standards so that everybody is entitled, entitled to the same degree of freedom and to the same degree of justice. This pessimistic view reduces, flattens mankind into automatons in the system. Again, Illich, great man. The things today with decisively new consequences are systems. And these are so built that they co-opt and integrate their users' hands, ears and eyes. The object has lost its distality, distance, by becoming systemic. No one can easily break the bonds forged by years of television absorption and curricular education that have turned eyes and ears into systemic components. Eyes and ears into systemic components. No longer open, no longer surprised, no longer adventurous. On the other side, at the other extreme, 
is the scepter of anarchy. If we don't have systems, we'll have anarchy. And everything will fall apart. And we will be uh, ravaged by disease, terrorism, fear, all those things. But I suggest that there is a third in-between kind of a sense of what could be a view of the, of the world as it is today. That view has been held by artists, by literature people, by ordinary human beings who tell stories to each other. They have known this for a long time. This is a very simple, realistic view of human beings. Human beings are complex creatures. They have, at times, they are capable of unexpected altruism, compassion, courage, sense of fairness. At other times, they are selfish, they are greedy. And both these things are part of being human. But the greater part of being human is to touch that ability to be fair, compassionate, just. And the kind of society that is made is made out of a community of human beings in solidarity, which can take chances to welcome the unpredictable. That the unpredictable is the very source of being human. That change which I cannot foresee, I can never manage. You know, I was many years ago, they started calling libraries knowledge management systems. And I thought, what utter rubbish! Knowledge should explode and it should never be possible to manage knowledge. How can you manage knowledge? Because it's all the time that energy coming out. Anyway, but for that kind of society to happen, for that society in which the better part of human beings are nurtured, are opened, then that society will have to have greater reliance on humility and modesty, a sense of caring, an experience of the interdependence of all on each other and on nature, and an adaptability that you are not fixed to certain conditions, but you are open to many, many different possibilities. This is not the way we are bringing up the children. No? And this, I think, is really the challenge before us, parents, teachers, everyone. How do we create that faith which knows that human... We, all of us have felt it. All of us have felt compassion. We might be greedy all the time. But once in a while we feel, Yaar, this ke liye kuch karo. Huh? You see how the students take care of the dogs on this campus. No? So that compassion is there. It is not as if it is uh, uh, the human being is a tr completely uh, greedy and selfish. There was a book called The Selfish Gene. And which uh, the gene might be selfish, but the total human being is not selfish, I think. <laughs> So, but this faith is of what kind? Doug Hammarskjöld. It is not the facile faith of generations before us, who thought that everything was arranged for the best in the best of worlds, or that physical and psychological development necessarily worked out towards something they called progress. It is in a sense a much harder belief. The belief and the faith that the future will be all right because there will always be enough people to fight for a decent future. Enough people. And this sense that Berkey brought to the entire group of people who studied with him is something which I think we have to hold together as all of us who are holding this fantastic sense that together something could happen. So then education. 
I have talked about society. I am going step by step, as Varki would have. Very, very systematic man he was. His lectures used to last four to four and a half hours. Mine will not, I can tell you. <laughs> so you could look at education in many different ways. You could look at education as a living process, as a process of opening up, as a process of freeing, as a process of letting, like you take a, you know how they free those pigeons and let them fly. Can the school be, can schools be those places where the wings have become strong because the food was good and they had enough friends and they had the mother who taught and they fly, you let loose and they fly. So could there be schools like that? In a special way, this is again Illich talking at the University of Bremen. In a special way, this university was conceived as an adventure. And I think, I dare say, this university was also conceived as an adventure, which knew no, which had no understanding of what is education. It had only a great hunger for learning and for finding out. It knew nothing about what is education. When the school started, there was not one teacher with any qualification at all. There was not one classroom which made sense. And this adventure continued in the minds of all those who studied here and continue to study here. And this adventure of this great continent of knowledge, this great ocean which we don't know anything about and there will be wild monsters in it and there will be wonderful dolphins and mermaids maybe. That adventure is what the school should be. That it is the place of adventure but which requires two things. According to Elich, it requires critique, the mind that is sharp and looks, but equally critique without what he calls ascesis, ascetics, you know, people who give up, people who give up, that the ability to leave everything, the ability not to be encumbered, the ability not to need and yet have the sharp vision that aces is. That is, aces is, is the space for reflection of going back inwards, leaving everything. That space has to be protected for education to be really something that frees. So that it becomes questions, not methods. It is an interaction, learning is an interaction, person to person, person to group, environment to person, which creates sympathy, sharing, which creates the sense that I put myself in your shoes and you put myself in mine, put yourself in mine. And I can see that sometimes when it's too difficult and I put myself in your shoes, maybe my language has to change. And still, still there is that sharing, that learning which is going on because we are engaging. So the task of education then, and Varki would say, mischief is very much required. Without mischief, you will not learn. How, uh, about what can we do mischief? You sit with an alto plan, and you cut it and then you laugh. I have seen him once, we were in a concert of Kumar Gandharva. After the interval the hall is always half empty. So there were few of us in the front seats. And Kumar, in his normal manner, he made some ridiculous sounds. You know, he used to sing wah, 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 that kind of thing. He made such sounds. 
and Varki is sitting in the third row, laughed out loud. Ha ha ha! And Kumar looked at him, twinkle in his eye, smiled. And this is what knowledge or the sense of seriousness is at once combined with the sense of mischief. I was telling Sohan the other day that the teacher has to be as much a cheater because he cheats and seduces the student into entering that world of adventure. And the cheater and the teacher are not very different. <laughs> Some students are equally good teachers and equally good cheaters. <laughs> so this, the tragic fate of the teacher is that he, his task, his metier, the task that he has taken upon himself requires him to explain what is unexplainable. How do you explain? How do you explain that the plan of Bank of England is a wonderful plan? Or Sir, Sir John Soane's work has some value. How do you explain that? You can't. And the teacher, and Varki was accused of teaching. In this place, he was accused of teaching because he made, you know, like we, for little children, we cut the chapati into little bites so that the child can eat. So he did that to Corbusier, he did that to Indian architecture, he did that to every architect. In Africa, he did it to African architecture. He cut it into bite sized pieces so that the student could understand. Once having understood, then he demanded to show in the drawing, where no such understanding can work. And this is the challenge of the teacher. So the teacher is an agent of transformation. He is not alone, because he himself constantly has to be transformed. And his transformation occurs in the group of teachers, in the community of teachers, in the community of thinkers, in the community outside that the buffeting of the world must transform every day the teacher. So that the teacher is never able to fit into systems, never. That is the challenge. There could be other modes of thinking about education. We need not go into them. I think the, uh, there is no point in contrasting it. Today education has become a sort of business in the late capitalist period where education is also a commodity which has to be attractively packaged and which you have to be willing to pay for in order that you will get paid. I mean the, the corruption is at both ends, as the, at the corruption of the consumer and the corruption of the producer. We are not talking about that. We are talking about education at its highest level. So then life. Education is about life. So we have to talk about life. I'll read you Illich. With amazing speed, the hardware and software of the 1980s bulldozed the material milieu that had been generated by human action. Bulldozed the material milieu that had been generated by human action and replaced it with a mostly technogenic, increasingly virtual, standard environment. He calls it algorithmic reductionism. Wonderful phrase. This topology, again Illich, this topology is well protected if not hidden by a self-image that, that it creates around itself, a self-image meant to give comfort to life beyond virtue and the good. Comfort, not virtue, not good. The aim to make life always better has crippled the search 
for the appropriate, the proportionate, the harmonious or simply good life. Because every day you have to come up with a new architecture. Because otherwise you will not stand in the market. Because architecture has become a commodity which is in magazines and posters, branded. And whether there can be something else, and if that something else can be, what could it be? Well, there might be a few paradigms. The simplest is the best. The simplest is the best. New is not necessarily better. I'm going to read it as if it, these are commandments, you know. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. New is not necessarily better. Good is not always pleasant or gratifying. You know, your medicine is bitter. But there are also developed tastes, you know. Uh, our great friend Rajiv Taranath always says, that mature people like bitter things. And he has a specific range of bitter things, but that I can leave aside for the moment. But that the fact that it, life is not only sweet, not only pleasant, is also hard work, is also sometimes you sweat, sometimes you are uncomfortable, all of that is part of it. The best is unexplainable and it can't be sold. It can never be sold. Some people will buy it, but they won't know why they are buying it. But the best cannot be sold. And works on many intensely and for a long time. So if we look at architecture, and now life naturally goes into architecture, Architecture, if we go by that, that paradigm of consumption, will become a commodity, has become to some extent, but not necessarily so for everyone. There are courageous or wild or mad architects still making non-commodity architecture. I think some of them are here in this audience, because that's why they were called. <laughs> because they are partly mad. <laughs> the world thinks that they don't know how to do it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm not thinking specifically of Revati. <laughs> <laughs> so, it if it becomes a commodity of consumption, the appleization of form, you know, the appleization of form, everything. Look at apple products. Each one is packaged so beautifully that even if you don't need it, you salivate and you want it. <laughs> and that shutting down of all the ability to discriminate between what I will use and what I will flaunt. This is what happens with architecture as well, because the magazines will promote and you will think that I have to become like that. But will you have to become like that is the question that I am putting before you. Your next five years, your next ten years before your practice gets established, can you be that wild, mad person till it becomes a habit to not accept? the paradigm of laked capitalism. I also call this appleization as the funky cool syndrome. This is so-and's word for it. So, gravitas, you know what is gravitas? Maybe the students don't know it. Gravitas is the sense of seriousness or the importance, significance of something. It is related to gravity. So, architecture has a gravitas. It has gravity, of course, and structural systems are based on that. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the significance in cultures, 
that architecture holds. And that gravitas will be replaced by self-indulgent gratification, if we are not careful. Obsolescence will be built in. Buildings will be made to last for 100 years, which the structural codes require, but they will be used for 10 years and then demolished. Obsolescence will be built in. The timeless will become a meaningless jingle. We used to talk about the timeless value of things. Christopher Alexander, poor guy, he wrote a book called The Timeless Way. He's very old now and not very well. Not, not the fault of writing that book. <laughs> Maybe he is almost timeless. Mickey knows him, so probably he can say something. <laughs> With that will be the, and yes, one more, the tragic will be replaced by the farcical. You know, in theatre you have tragedy. In tragedy what do you have? You have some important action, culturally important action which comes against great odds and finally accepts that life is complex, life has many colours. The farce, on the other hand, only divides and laughs. And the tragic will be replaced by the farcical, which we can see in much architecture today. The erasure of scale, for example. Yes, we need to make large buildings because there are very large organizations which need to be made, given offices and so on. But can the large building become something which has scale? I think of Alto's universities. I think of Sir John Sons Bank of England. I think of uh, Sri Rangam. Huge building. It has a sense of scale. Because it is also worked upon by time and by many agents. And it is not the work of a single individual. John Son was a single individual. But others had made London before him. And he was working in collaboration with what London was. So, in a sense, if we are serious about architecture, we will look at scale. We we'll look at the sense of wonder. Wonder is not simply going gaga. Wonder is becoming speechless. And if in one life I can make one corner of a building where that happens, moksha, done. <laughs> Nothing more is required. Not yet. But that is our, our search as architects. And the diminution of significance has to be countered. So now, what about the future? I'll read one passage. I'll read two passages. One again from Doug Hammarskjöld. This he was speaking to the at the opening of an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And he writes, he says, we have to approach our task, and he's talking about politics, mind you. He's not talking about, he's talking about politics. We have to approach our task in the spirit which animates the modern artist. We have to tackle our problems without the armor of inherited convictions or set formulas, but only with our bare hands and all the honesty we can muster. And we have to do so with an unbreakable will to master the inert matter of patterns created by history and sociological conditions. So it's not that you just accept. You know, there's this thing that maybe my talk is saying, look backwards, you know. Um, timelessness and all that kind of, here's an old man with a white beard talking about the old old times. Uh, so there is this very wonderful story about 
uh, going forward. So there was a man who believed always in moving forward, never backwards, never go back, always forward. So he was walking and he came to the edge of a cliff. And if he had gone forward, he would have fallen 1000 feet below. So he walked backwards. And he said that at certain times walking backwards is forwards. So now, this backwards is what work he was interested in. This backwards to go back to the juicy sources, to go back to that soil which, which will give us. So, his favorite, this one, one passage from Paul Ricoeur, the phenomenon of universalization, while being an advancement of mankind, at the same time constitutes a sort of subtle destruction. Not only traditional cultures, which might not be an inseparable wrong, even if traditional cultures are destroyed, it might not be an insuperable wrong or an irreplaceable, irreparable wrong, sorry, but also what I call for the time being the creative nucleus of great cultures, that nucleus on which we interpret life, what I shall call in advance the ethical and mythical nucleus of mankind. There is the paradox how to become modern and to return to sources, how to revive an old dormant civilization and take part in universal civilization. This wonderful passage, doesn't it say what we are all facing in our work every day? Students, as much as those who are doing work outside, who are teaching, all of us. So then, how do we manage that? How do we find the resources with which? One last quotation from Dag Hammarskjöld. To preserve the silence within, amid all the noise, to remain open and quiet, a moist humus in the fertile darkness where the rain falls and the grain ripens. No matter how many tramp across the parade ground in the whirling dust under an arid sky. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Chaya. Actually, uh, a lot of students of yours, like me, and uh, students of Professor Verki, have been itching since a long time to invite you for the Kurla Verki Memorial Lecture, because it takes us back to our student days, uh, where there were many instances of uh, both heated discussions and uh, uh, informal chats at the canteen. And today, after a long time, I'm sure all of us were transported back uh, to that time. And we'll remember this, not as a fond memory, but something that will hopefully, something that is a force that will affect us in all that we do. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Professor Chaya and Alice, uh, for this uh, good <laughs> talk.